this is a different approach color. to colors. Uh, the whole point of this talk is to be able to help people uh, come up with their own approach to colors. Uh, it's very important that we discover colors in our own way rather than colors in the way we are taught to. Because everybody has their own unique story that they want to get out. Everybody's experienced life very differently, and I hope that one day, like if you choose to do colors, that this this might be able to help you tell your story. Um, so, but normally when I put together a speech, I try to start. As, I try to sound as smart as possible, uh, so the audience can assume that their time isn't wasted. Uh, but given everybody here today, uh, whew. all right, just trust that I'm not a potato at this point, okay? Uh, okay. So if you've ever asked yourself. How does this person come up with their colors? How did they do a good job? Um, and then they answer you with like the most generic response of just like, oh, well, I don't know. I just kind of put colors on the pages. That's very frustrating. Uh, a lot of us like you will just feel like they're lost. They've gone nowhere. We don't know how to interpret that because, well, the truth is, not knowing is kind of the answer. Uh, the reason I say this is because, um, let's see, art and color is the heart, not the mind. Uh, in fact, like the less, uh, by, there's a quote by some famous artist that I'm just going to paraphrase phrase right now pretend that uh there was a really smart person that said this but he said to him and i will remember this to my death he said that the less he's thinking when he's drawing the better his art becomes um now let's see uh because uh what you have is unique to the world um, some of you might be thinking like, no, like literally everything's already been invented. Uh, I'm here to tell you the good news. No, that's not true because the fact that we've invented electric cars that the average human being can buy, uh, with, with the wages, uh, and Julius Caesar did not come up with this stuff. We can be rest assured that we can still continue developing and still discover new colors and new things and with every new addition to our discoveries with every new addition to our findings we are changing the way we interpret colors and the way we can find colors so if you don't think that you're unique if you don't think that so on and you think that you're just like everybody else you're very unique trust me on this one just trust me guys um so let's talk about our feelings, right? We love talking about our feelings. Uh, a lot of, normally when I'm talking with people, uh, they will always tell me like, you have to do it this way, or you have to do it this way, or so on and so forth. Uh, no, you have to do it the way your feelings tell you. Um, but now a lot of people that I've talked with, a lot of people that I've dealt with have all told me like oh well um art is the golden ratio if you don't do the golden ratio your art is bad um or the fibonacci sequence uh for those of you who don't know what the fibonacci sequence it is uh an addition of one plus one to two and then two plus one to three and then three plus two to five so you take the solution of the original edition, and then you add it to the previous number that was before it. And then you just create this like whole line of sequence of numbers that is supposedly creating uh, a perfect ratio. And the problem with this is that it sort of pins down what art is supposed to be, and that kind of takes away the certain creativity that we have. Um, so, did I just scroll up? Oops. Okay, so now we also have that one professor that's always going to tell us, like, paint with passion. <laughs> I hate that professor. I hate him so much. He doesn't tell me anything. He just says, go with your feelings. Uh, please don't. Um... You definitely do want to go with your feelings, but passion is too broad of a term. So I'll translate it for the engineers in the background. Uh, passion 
is just a stronger form of the current feeling that we are feeling. So if you're angry, uh, then you're prob- you might not be as loud. Now, if you're me, you're passionate about being angry, you're probably yelling really loud. Everybody in the room can tell. And a lot of us are very thankful for being able to turn the specific users down 50%. Um, now, colors are the language of feelings. So anytime that we have like, um, Anytime we are feeling something, there is an un, there is a phenomenon that links those colors with whatever we're feeling. Science can't really prove why we feel these ways. Um, they can give you reasons, they can give you explanations, but in the end, uh, we don't really know why colors make us feel a specific way. Uh, like just watch any Bob Ross video. And he'll tell you he simply puts trees down and colors down because they felt lonely. So (laughs) it's a very, very, it's great. You should watch Bob Ross sometime. Um, If I can scroll down. So let me tell you why you should ignore math and science for the most part. Uh, That's not the right slide. Let's go this one. So this is the Marquette phase. How many of you guys, by show of hands, like how many of you guys have seen this face before? The face is up. Okay, yeah. You, okay, so great. This is wonderful. This face, I hate this fucking face. I, I hate it so much. Um, the reason is, is that like, this doesn't look like an attractive face to me. I can't really relate to this face. Um, now, mathematically, it said that if your proportions line up with this face, then yeah, uh, then you're going to be really beautiful and whatnot. The unfortunate part of this is that I've seen like ugly people who are getting married before me and clearly their husband or wife finds them a lot more attractive than me. So like uh, they definitely don't follow the rule of thumb here. Uh, So now if science or math is right, then the most attractive person in the world will have this face. Fortunately, Nobody looks like this. So let me show you what happens when you change faces to match the perfect face. Uh, This is a form of the Marquette face. There is actually several forms, Uh, but let's watch the video. Um, It's got really terrible music. So I hope everyone can (laughs) deal with that. Uh, Next slide is, oh, there it is. Oh yeah, there you go. So here's Megan Fox where uh, this person is moving their faces to fit within the perfect boundaries of the rule of thumb. I love this because you could look at this, uh, you think it's gonna turn out great. Oh boy, you guys are in for a treat. Handsome Squidward. (laughs) Handsome Squidward looks much better than this, trust me. So, Okay, you can see that she's getting the jawline, uh, moving the hairline down to get more youthful. Oh, no. There's Megan Fox. And there it is where she's perfect. I, why? I, she had a good face before. Yeah. What happened? Not bad. Uh, now we've got Billie Eilish. Uh, she's ugly, right? Because no. clearly we need to fix some things. We need to fix. <laughs> you, this thing says you need to, man. you got to trust science and math here. So again, fixing the eyebrows because apparently they're too high. Moving the eyes going to be inwards because they're apparently too far apart. Moving the nose down. Mm-hmm. Mm, perfect. Look at that. You guys ready for your dream girlfriend? <laughs> this is going to be great. <laughs> All right. Oh. Check. All right. See? And then you have that one, which is just like, eh. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very uncomfortable to see. Uh, just wait till we get to James Charles, everybody. This you ladies should enjoy oh, this no. one. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Here we go. Uh, moving the eyes in once again. Apparently too far apart. Nose down. Having small, cute noses not the way to go. Uh, lips. Everyone loves those plumpy lips. <laughs> I hope sarcasm translates here. <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> All right, and here we go. 
In three, two, one. Let's see it. I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, what, what's going on here? Um, yeah. So it's it's almost like uh, the ugly one is after. <laughs> uh, believe it or not. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop there because like I want to make sure that there's enough time to talk about. Uh, okay. So I've seen that. Whoa, call it. Everybody's familiar with this. Um, yes. I'll come back to this in a second. It's a bagel. Uh, where's my? I've seen those. Pick up my slide. Or my notes because I need to remember what I was going to say. There is so thank you everybody for being patient, by the way. Uh, this has been a very fun experience. Love I you, hope Connie. to mute any one time. Um, okay, cool. Uh, okay. So, uh, basically, about that video, uh, long story short, if uh, math is what makes you be called beautiful, then be glad that uh, you're not beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, the other thing, math isn't for everybody, so let's keep it that way. I, I personally would like to keep it that way. Uh, so, another thing that scientists try to stick their nose in is shapes. Uh, that was a huge argument over the most aesthetically pleasing shape. Uh, long, long story short, uh, it was believed that if you had a rectangle with a certain distance across the top and a certain distance across the height, on the height, then you, most people would love this rectangle. They would see it and they would be like, that's a good looking rectangle. The problem with this is, is that uh, a this is this is confirmation bias. Like I, I don't know who decided that this was the right thing to do. Uh, Devlin, um, the writer and professor at a college, to the myth that won't go away. Uh, he has an ongoing study with his classmates in which the shapes in which shapes is the most attractive shape in the world. He took several rectangles of various shapes and sizes and shows them to his class. Uh, the results are completely random. Uh, apparently, there was never a clear winner in which shape looked the best, and they were asked several times as well, uh, and they seemed to choose at random. Like, they were asked several times, they would pick a different shape. Uh, I don't know if this is the, them being confusing or them wanting to get out of class sooner. Uh, the Another study, study done at the Haas School of Business at Berkeley uh, found that consumers, uh, so, so the the question is, is like, what's the most attractive angle? Uh, and the angles with 1.614 uh, is supposed to be the most attractive. And while consumers prefer the angles between the ratios of 1.14, or 1.414 and 1.732, uh, the golden ratio of 1.618 or one four, uh, just didn't seem to be a clear winner either. So while it's within those ranges, uh, it doesn't seem to be a uh, clear winner, once again. Uh, another important fact is that to all these mathematicians and scientists that try to dictate how art and color should be done, is how many of these artists, or how many of these mathematicians and artists aren't mathematicians and scientists aren't artists all of them will try to tell you why art it looks good none of them will be able to do what they're saying and leave it up to whatever their belief is um leonardo da vinci is questionably the only mathematician and scientist you could say uh did know how to do um art but he he was never quoted, never once found to be using the golden ratio himself, other than a coincidence in the, the last dinner with Jesus and his disciples. Uh, and it wasn't even like the main focus. It was just the something in the background. Uh, so let's hope their scientists never get their hands on the color wheel. Uh, there's, there's some weird shit going on. I thought I had it in the slide. Uh, 
But he has not. Um, so who determines... Uh, the reason why I want to bring this up is because I'm going to show you this color wheel is not something that dictates what looks good. However, it is a tool that you can use to help create aesthetically pleasing color palettes. Uh, the number one thing you should realize is that this is one color wheel. There is several different kinds of color wheels. I'm just going to stick with the most basic form. Uh, there's RGB, uh, which is another form of this. RYB, which is the standard for subtractive color theory. There's a color triangle, which ignores the circle, which means that if you go outside the circle, you're being wrong. Uh, there's a color square, which is the, uh, the hue cube, which just makes things a little bit more confusing. Uh, we're just going to stick with this one for now, since the color wheel is the most widely used uh, form of color theory. Uh, so who determines what looks good? This is this is such a hard question. Uh, there, nobody really can say what looks good, what um, what is the best looking color, what is best looking um, color pattern. Uh, you could say that the professor at CalArts knows what looks good. You could say that uh, people who study colors for a very long time say what good, looks good. And you can hope that I, giving this presentation, might be able to tell you what looks good. But in the end, you, not one single person can tell you what looks better than the other because it's a matter of translation from a language and its meaning. Um, so, so uh, colors that were invented in the 60s, the color palettes that were used in the 60s, they didn't look good in the 80s. Uh, the 80s is what looks good in the 21st century for some reason. Uh, and what looked good in the 1910s is not necessarily what may look good in the future. Uh, things are constantly changing. Uh, we will always find a better question for what is right or what is needed for the particular project that we are doing. Uh, the secret to good colors is not to ask what is wanted, what we want to put down on paper. It's to ask that painting what is needed for it. Uh, and the reason why we do that is because when we only do what we want and not what the painting needs, is our color palette to starts to resemble our diets on lockdown. And while we were able to eat anything that we wanted to, we probably should get a blood screening check for diabetes on account of all of the tubs of ice cream we've went through. Uh, it's really not a good healthy habit. Uh, so <laughs> what do I mean by what is needed versus what is wanted versus what we uh, scientists say should be the color? When I say what is needed, um, the question is not asking like, oh, what does science say you think it needs? You ask the painting itself because the painting will often tell you like what is not standing out enough. What is What message do you want to bring to the painting or our color palettes uh, or anything else of the like? Because we're trying to get a message across, not be the, the prettiest girl uh, specifically for uh, color palettes. Uh, color harmonies are probably the easiest way to do that. Um, they they basically assign literally everything. All of the colors work hand in hand. Um, they help us understand that um, what works with other colors, what doesn't work with colors, what can work with colors, what probably should work with colors. Um, color harmonies are always shifting their roles. Uh, seem, some are playing the support role to lift other colors to the front, and some are playing the, uh, the dominant role where it is the major hierarchy color that shifts our eyes through the rest of the painting or the color palette uh, so that we can experience a nice train ride with our eyes being led through the painting so we can better see the message or the uh, what we're trying to say with a specific color palette. If you want advanced colors, colors that control our feelings, uh, check out Mark Rothko, uh, go to an art museum, 
uh, you'll probably be impressed there. <laughs> Not, but today I'm going to do just some nice and simple stuff. And uh, now we'll finally start talking about colors. So, let's see, the first we have on the slide is analogous colors. Analogous colors, uh, if I had to give them a definition or assign them a feeling, uh, analogous colors are stuff, I would call them union colors. If you look at all of the colors up on top right here, you have uh, those three arrows, they're pointing to the three major color groups that you would use to uh, get colors uh, put together. But basically, analogous colors are there to represent that everybody's going hand in hand people are nice to each other good things are coming together as look as how these colors are basically right next to each other they're all hugging all of these colors are hugging so if you want a harmonious and in perfect union kind of color to represent that everything's okay you can do that if you want to shift the hues or um shift the values and bring the colors all the way down to dark it's like bad things getting together and they're like they're conspiratory they're getting together and they're being like Ooh, what are we gonna start the mischief and whatnot um blues are adventurous colors so if you put all of those together think of the ocean um it always was something that we never understand still to this day we haven't gone to the very bottom um, it's their colors of adventure. So think of it like a group of people getting together, getting ready to go on an adventure. Uh, that's how I would define union colors. Um, next, we have contrasting colors. Contrasting colors are colors that are basically on the opposite ends of the wheel. That's, that's really... That's just as complicated as they get. <laughs> uh, so it's... Color contrast colors are competitive colors. They're not necessarily trying to compete for which one's better than the other, but they're colors that are trying to have a fight, like a playful fight. So if you wanted to show that like one team was facing the other team, it's best represented like, like with orange versus blue. Um, and maybe it's a, it's a little bit more exciting because now you have like a nice battle throughout your designs painting to see uh, which one comes out on top. Uh, now we have triadic colors. Uh, triadic colors are, I think, are my favorite kind right now. Um, triadic colors are basically groups, uh, if I were to describe them as people. Uh, they're groups of people coming from different ends of the Earth and meeting together to either have uh, um, fun, uh, talk about stuff, or so on and so forth. So it's the meeting of several different parties from different areas, from different studies, coming together to share with what they have, or share with the audience what they have. Uh, you'll notice that if you look at my outfit, it's technically triadic color theory. Um, I've done this specifically because uh, I wanted some adventure, I wanted some excitement, and I wanted some high energy levels to be represented through this color palette. Now, uh, colors are actually more assigned specifically to, how should I say it? Um, they're more how we've experienced them. So while I've said that this color might be adventurous, um, exciting and fun, um, it may be different for people. Like, uh, all of these colors, that's the cool thing about color languages. It's like, you can say there, but there could mean three different things, like it does in the English language. Rip people try to learn English. Uh, so you might be excited about the colors of Del de Muerto. I hope I said that right. <clears throat> um, and this is actually... The thing I love about these colors is that these are a lot of exciting and bright and fun colors, but they're trying to remember the dead. So uh, to them, these colors probably mean more spiritual um, importance rather than more exciting and adventurous. Or maybe, it, I don't know, maybe, maybe I learned more. Uh, or you might be from the far north where snow was your entire culture. And this is, and you might find this beautiful. 
beautiful, more beautiful than the other paintings. So uh, as you can see here, this one's using a nice simple palette. Uh, I would say it's using complementary colors. So the cool thing about this is like, you might think that white here is the color. Um, there's some blacks in here, and then you've got some orange backgrounds. But it's actually technically um, uh, complementary colors because white is never pure white. White is always a tint of blue. And in order to give that little reflecting of the sun sort of deal, or reflecting of the sky to get a little bit more blues. And you'll see that as it goes into the shadows here, um, you have a lot more blues. Uh, you can see that the walls are painted with some blues, uh, maybe a little bit of green here to give it a little bit more texture. But the dominating color here is actually blue. Also, white isn't a color. Um, then you have the orange in the background, which this is a shade of yellow and orange in the background on the houses. Then you have the bright orange chimneys, which brings out the foreground here. So we, if we really wanted to go on an adventure with our eyes, we would probably start here. Make our way like, woo, wow, a little cabin door. Oh, there's a purse. Um, oh, hey, now we're home. Nice. So um, it separates these colors, help separate the background from the foreground. And that is one way that you can use contrasting colors is that you have the background, um, so different levels of depth, and you kind of experience the painting in your own way. Maybe your eyes are very ADHD, and you're like, oh, wow, maybe I want to go over here. Huh? Woo, go up the tree, down the tree. Woo, up this tree, down the tree. Woo, oh, gee, that's cool. Uh, and so on and so forth. So we can actually go on an adventure with our eyes through its uh, colors. Now, let me show you some bad paintings. Uh, I have to show them as an example because I do. I did a little bit of color correcting through these paintings to show what we can do to fix bad color palettes. So the problem with this painting is that we've got a lot of competing colors here. The blue is trying to be the most vibrant. The purple is trying to be the most vibrant. The orange is trying to be the most vibrant. None of these colors are really working with each other. And if you go back to your color wheel, you'll really find that only two of these colors really go together. I don't know what the fuck the green is doing over here. Like it's doing its own little party. Uh, same with the island. I guess it's having a good time on its own. Uh, so here is if we color shift it, uh, this was the quick color shifting. We can see that everything works a little bit more together now. So even though this is dark, we read this as like a tree still. We read this as mountain. Um, the purple uh, is reflecting the sky a little bit more. So this is a more literal approach to getting a proper sunset. Uh, and now we have our main focus here, which is the orange sun. Refle and then it reflects a little bit onto the water so that we can still get a little bit of dynamic use of our colors here. So this would probably be more contrasting colors. Um, now, it's not a direct contrast, as this is a purple and orange. If you really wanted the right contrast to this, it would actually be uh, blue. But that's the cool thing, is that it's got a little bit of color shift down so that it helps make the rest of this painting sense. I have another example where we'll be a little bit more crazy with colors. So I'll show you. Here, again, we're having a similar problem where it's like they wanted a cool sunset, they wanted an ocean, they wanted some green, and they wanted bright felt colors. None of this works uh, because, well, you have the bright orange, the bright red, which is a not necessarily a contrasting color to the blue here, and you've got like a bright green. All of these colors are competing with each other. Uh, this house is having another little party by itself. Um, it's really dark, doesn't make sense with the rest of the palette. Uh, and, well, I mean, it's not really, you could say that it's not wrong, but it's, I don't think it's trying to say what it's trying to say. Uh, but let's say I'm trying to say something with this painting and I'm going to use triadic colors here. 
Now here, we have a little bit more of an abstract use of this paint with the laser pointing up. Here it is. So here we have a lot more abstract use of colors here. This is triadic color theory uh, using on the RGB color wheel. We can see that we've got bright yellow, blues, and purples. Theoretically, none of this makes sense, but we can still get a little bit of more aesthetically pleasing sort of form. It's a lot more abstract, so you you don't encounter it as like a sunset. Maybe this is like supposed to make you feel a little a bit more joyous, maybe a bit more mysterious. You have yellow in the background here, which is active color, so high energy. You've got blue over here, which is um, adventure, and then you've got mystery here. Like, ooh, herb. Ah. But he loves purple. Um, so, uh, now let's talk a little bit more on why I use the triadic colors. Um, Basically, the so what kind of thing. Uh, so we have, why does this matter? Uh, I don't know, what did my notes? Uh, it basically just helps us be able to translate what we're trying to tell our audience here. So if you're making a color palette, let's say you're making a world, you want to show that the world is different from the us. Maybe you're tired of all of the browns and the what's habits of like all of the literally every uh, mirror world that you've seen. Maybe you want to convey that you're being on an alien world. You can do that with abstract colors. You can do that with different color languages. So if you really want to know um, what colors should follow uh, and what you're trying to do, I can actually go through some of these colors and tell you what they mean. So red here is meant to give you a lot of high energy. Uh, a lot of um, violence, maybe, if you're like a dark person. Uh, yellow here uh, is our active color. Maybe you're an athlete. Uh, I hate you. Um, blue here is a lot of uh, mystery, or it's adventure. It's a sense of adventure. Uh, this, I think, is an evolutionary trait, if I had to theorize anything. Uh, so it lets you go through, because we were very land mammals for a long time up until we could sail the open seas uh it it always gave you a sense of adventure we never really knew what was beyond the blue so if you want to do something adventurous include lots of blues purple is meant to be a mystery we don't really see purples naturally occurring in nature a lot so whenever we do see something purple we're like Ooh, what could this mean uh to talk about green because as I was highly requested to talk about, green is either a very boring color <laughs> or a, a very destructive color. Uh, it's it's kind of weird how green acts in um, RGB theory versus um, RYB theory. And so since we're using our screens right now, I'm going to talk about uh, RGB theory versus our, this is RYB, this is RGB. Uh, right? Sure. No, this is, it looks different. Okay, uh, so this is just both RGB, I guess. Uh, um, RGB is when your primary colors are red, um, blue, and green. And that's additive color theory. So what that means is like the more we combine these colors together, uh, as you can see on the color wheel, the more light they get. Because light, white is technically a, a giving off every color. Uh, in according to RGB colors. Um, our YB color, I don't have it here, I guess this was supposed to be, but I, maybe the screen show. But our YB is supposed to be red, yellow, and blue. Uh, uh, so RGB means that the more colors you put together, the darker it becomes. So that's subtractive color theory, our YB. Uh, so if you are using worlds, you want to be using or doing worlds or VR stuff or avatars, you really, really want to focus on using the RGB color wheel. There's lots of good examples. Uh, to talk about my avatar a little bit more, uh, specifically, I actually broke the rules. Um, the reason uh, why it's important to remember that these are tools. Tools! These are not actual solutions. 
uh, they just help us get to our solutions, is that this yellow here is actually against RGB color. Uh, notice it would not form the triangle. That blue, that the red, got like yellow. Who knows why? It's, uh, so it wouldn't form a proper triangle. Color. The reason why I did this is because, uh, not because I hate green, uh, because I just, I felt like, I really felt like it needed a little bit more yellow to represent the character more. So yellow being the more active color, the sporty. Um, so to help you remember that, uh, remember, fuck off. No, not fuck off. I mean, like, fuck off. Like, so it's feeling, color theory, then feeling again. So you want to approach colors with feeling. What is the message you're trying to say? What are you trying to feel? Like, what do your feelings say about the thing you're trying to say? You, if you're starting to do it, and then you're having a little bit of trouble feeling what that is, making it all work together, then you use color theory. Uh, color theory will help you realign your colors, make sure that they give the optimum value. And then you want to go back to feeling because in the end, you're not trying to make the most perfect thing. Uh, you're trying to make the most beautiful thing. And that just depends on your message. So beauty, then the eye of the beholder, feeling helps us remember that. So we're not, again, we're not trying to impress some scientists. We're trying to impress our audience. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I do have a couple of quick tips uh, for coming up with your colors, helping decipher your colors. Uh, it, it, so, if you are using colors and you're trying to put like literally every color in the world together, uh, back to our color wheel here, you can't put every color in the world into your world unless you know what you're doing so yes all of these can technically go into your world but what are you trying to say with that are you trying to say that like Ooh, wow rainbows are ready i i would challenge you to keep it as simple as possible once you start mixing in a ton of colors it can get a little complicated your message might come become unclear uh no offense to the pride flag uh go yeah uh, you got to keep your colors as simple as possible so that it makes your message easier to get off. Um, you let's see, use references. I'm not lying when I still trace. I, if I can't figure out how to do something, I will trace or I will steal colors. I will literally grab the eyedropper problem off the garb. Maybe, um, maybe not him is the best example, but maybe like something Fiona makes and <laughs> And I would, Aww. I will use those colors because um, sometimes, like, I have to admit that I don't know everything about colors and I should try experiencing it through somebody else's for a little bit more inspiration. Um, let's see. Mix up the amount of color you use. You do not want to use an equal amount of red, an equal amount of blue, and an equal amount of green. That's big, stupid, dumb, dumb. Uh, because then you're all really competing with your colors again. They're competing with space taken up. Uh, if you look at my avatar, I use primarily reds, and then the second number of color I use, or primarily blues, the second color I use is reds, and then I've got like a little bit of yellow on me. Um, and the reason you do this is just to make it more interesting. Remember, your colors are not there to compete. They're there to work with each other. And sometimes that means one color taking the supporting role and the other color taking the um, primary role of delivering your message. So if you were to remember what I talk talked about in the video, you would say that I'm primarily about adventure. Uh, if you were just to decipher it using the color language. And that is about all I have to talk about. Um...